Countdown to Eternity audience, listen, before the show starts, I want to let you in on something that our radio audience is not going to know, but you're going to know because you are watching a video. And that is, Monkey is wearing a little bit of a sling, and it kind of looks funny because it's got his new puppy in it. And he's so dedicated to wanting to get this show done that he's actually holding the puppy while he's doing the show. So when you see something that looks a little peculiar, you guys will know what it is. All right. Let's start Countdown to Eternity. Countdown to Eternity starts now. Well, hello, my dear brothers and sisters. We want to welcome you to another episode of Countdown to Eternity. And folks, we are talking about one crazy season that we are in. I don't even think powder keg is the way to describe it. Things that are happening around the world are explosive. When you look at the Middle East... It is getting absolutely insane, and I can tell you this with great confidence, the enemy, our enemy, the devil, is working overtime, but I am with Monkey. We are very happy to be here with you to talk about what is going on. We've got Turkey that is uh, on the brink of declaring war against Israel. Yemen has already declared war. We're hearing about other countries declaring war. What happens and what are the biblical issues that surround this We're going to talk about that today. We've got a lot to talk about, but before we get into it, Monkey, how are you, brother? I am doing fantastic, man. I'm just watching this world, and and, uh, you're right. He's he's definitely busy, Uh, and when I say he, I mean little H. Uh, Yeah, this guy is, uh, he's got his hands in every bit of this, and uh, I was just, I just did a video the other day talking about just uh, that he is definitely here. He's among us. He may not know who he is, and we don't know who he is. Because we know he'll be revealed once we're gone. But you can see everything going on around us that shows us and proves to us that we're in end-time prophecy. And uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, well, look, if we're this close to exiting, this guy's got to be, he's got to be among us somewhere. Yeah. No, I uh, wholeheartedly agree with you. And I believe that Second Thessalonians chapter 2 Verse 3 makes that very clear. When we talk about this departure, it is not a departure from the faith. It is actually referring to the departure from this earth by Christians in the rapture. And um, it is uh, quite interesting when you stop for a moment to reflect upon what that all means. We know that the final Antichrist cannot be revealed to this world until the church is raptured because we, being filled with the Holy Spirit, act as the preserving influence, but oh my goodness, we are seeing everything begin to manifest. And when we look at the manifestations of all of these signs that are coming from the Middle East alone, the level of instability in the region and what may be the brink of so many issues, these birth pangs that we read about in Matthew 24, the wars and rumors of wars and all of the things that are happening, we're on the brink of some pretty amazing things happening and it's just mind-blowing. To think about the implications of it all. Yeah, it really is. And uh, as as you know, I track these flights and I watch all of it happening. And uh, I'm trying to be a little more sensitive now with with what I actually put out there because I have different reads on some things that I, I don't think want to be broadcast, you know, to the masses, so to speak. And uh, it is, uh, you know, like for example, and this isn't uh, probably a shocker to anybody, we've already heard that we are deploying missile defense systems into the region. Well, I watched C-17s loading up at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and who was out of that? Missile defense, right? So you can see the big pieces get moved into place all around the world, and uh, it tells me that we are very close to the brink of war, and I think Israel is a shocker, but I think Israel is going to be at the heart of all of this. Oh, yeah, undoubtedly, and uh, it's amazing to see how the sentiment over the last month has changed so dramatically when they were first hit in what was the worst act of terror ever recorded in Israeli history uh, since the war that we read in 73, actually, quite frankly, very likely since the Holocaust, only because of how many civilians were actively targeted in this situation. Um, uh, There were so many people that were standing in solidarity with Israel, and there were so many people who were saying Israel needs to do what Israel needs to do, and we need to let them do it. And I warned everybody, you warned everybody, we warned everybody that this sentiment would wear out probably within about 10 days. And it wore out a lot sooner than that. There were people all over the world protesting, uh, supporting Hamas. Okay, let me say that again. 
supporting active, vicious, animalistic, demonically inspired terrorists, yeah. right? People marching for them and supporting them. And that brings us to the subject matter of today because now we have full-blown sovereign nations that are threatening war against Israel and in a few cases actually declaring war against Israel. Yeah. And the implications of what all of that are uh, of what all of that could be are absolutely spectacular. Yeah, they really are. Actually, I saw the fact that Israel just made the statement that hey, listen, our missiles can hit anywhere in the Middle East. And so that was a message to everybody that's thinking about bowing up on Israel that hey, listen, at the end of the day We'll go hot and we'll we'll hit anybody. There is nobody off limits. If you come at us, we're coming at you and you're not going to like it. And I think that is a message that needs to be, it needs to kind of, uh, you know, it has to have some substance to it for these folks to really get it. As you can see, they're, they're, uh, when you look at Hamas and Hezbollah, and the, they're, they're not very smart, right? They go up against, you know, I, Hezbollah made this, this statement that they're ready to take on our ships. And I think, do, do you really realize what that statement is and what you just basically threatened, uh, which they'll take away your very existence? And uh, Israel has the ability as well. And, oh, by the way, their arsenal is far more powerful than any of our arsenal here on this planet, and that is God, right? He is, if he can breathe us into existence, he can certainly breathe us out of existence. Well, what's funny is I believe what's driving this with Hezbollah and with Hamas and uh, many of these other organizations that are seeking to destroy Israel is they're carrying the same dangerous assumption that uh, many people are carrying right now, and that is Israel will not be prepared for any such attack. And of course, in some cases, like what we read about in Ezekiel 38, Israel will not be prepared for the attack. As a matter of fact, when Russia leads that conglomerate of nations against Israel, they will be what appears uh, to be successful in coming against the nation, right? Yeah. But God will intervene per Ezekiel 39 and will make sure that they are unsuccessful and he will obliterate those countries. So we know that God himself will intervene, but it is interesting because when you look at what happened with this initial uh, uh, just atrocious barbaric act by Hamas, a lot of people who are willing to be honest that are coming out of Israelis intelligence camps and are coming out of the IDF are all going to tell you the same thing. We were proud about this. We were unprepared. We underestimated our enemy. We did not assume that Hamas would be the greater concern and an overwhelming majority of our efforts was focused on the North. And even then we restricted the amount of weapons that our people in some of the kibbutzes could have. And they understood that now that they made a terrible mistake in that underestimation. The thing that's particularly unique about this circumstance is Israel's never gonna make that mistake again. Not only are they never going to make that mistake again, they're actually going to be uniquely and remarkably aggressive about how they pursue uh, every aspect of what they do in seeking to defend their homeland. So this is going to create a big problem uh, for a lot of people, and this goes right back to Jerusalem being that cup of trembling. I mean, uh, we're, we're seeing that. It's all manifesting right now. It's right in front of us. Yeah, it really is. Imagine how this would have shaped up had Netanyahu not been in office. Oh, right? the week that was in office and how this would have probably been, you know, uh, handled it with peace and tolerance, right? Versus we see today, which is old school, you know, Old Testament, you know, uh, scorched earth. But that's how you have to treat your enemy. You don't, you don't treat your enemy with peace and tolerance. You have to fight evil with, you know, a vengeance coming back on them so that they, they don't ever want to do it again. The thing that a lot of folks are, are losing sight of is the fact that the social media aspect of this is fueling things on the right. So it's not just a matter of large countries like Turkey and, uh, you know, all the others around like Yemen, exact, you know, et cetera, that are trying to, to threaten war with Israel. But from the social media perspective, there is a lot of fake media and fake news going out there by the mainstream media. That yeah. is just completely false. For example, uh, there was a, a picture that was shown, and they said it was a, a recent event that just took place in Gaza in this this whole effort. Turns out it was from uh, Egypt in 2013. 
So there's stuff that is surfacing that has absolutely nothing to do with this. Another one, too, was uh, there's a child in one of the pictures that has been, you know, saying that if you, st- you know, if you stand, raise your hand if you stand with Palestine. And this kid has six fingers and yeah, nobody picks up AI. on that. It's AI. It, it's all AI. Yeah. Yeah. And so these instruments are being used to fuel this war. And it's they're being used to incite riots around the world and a lot of other things. And uh, you don't really think about that aspect of it because we don't really see that part of the news or that part of the world on our, our regular you know, news streams here. But that is what's going on around the world, and that's why they hate us so much. And, but we need to be cognizant of it because they're coming for us. <laughs> no two ways about it. 100%. Yeah, I mean, and bro, the, uh, uh, the implications of all of that – are not, they should not be surprising to anybody. And they're very biblical in many ways. I mean, if you stop for one moment to to consider just a, a map of what's going on around us and you look at everything that's actually happening and you start right in Israel and you look at all of the nations that surround us uh, in Israel, it's it's such a unique situation what's happening amongst all of these people geopolitically, Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, really unbelievable right now. There's a new discussion going on about Turkey and, uh, Turkey declaring war against, uh, Israel and what happens if Turkey does so. And if Turkey attacks Israel and Israel, uh, retaliates against Turkey, Turkey is a member of NATO. So what happens? Does article five actually kick in and do all the other nations now have to follow uh, Turkey. And uh, listen, I'm not saying that this is going to happen. Like, d- please don't say that this is me predicting anything. But here's a scenario that looks really interesting. Think about this for a second. Imagine that war gets declared by Turkey against Israel. And then NATO basically says we're not going to get involved because Turkey you unilaterally acted against Israel and we are not looking to execute Article 5 when Article 5 was brought on by unilateral action that we had no discussion of. And then Turkey's membership to NATO becomes invalidated, which, by the way, is something that could really happen because NATO hasn't ever really been completely sold on Turkey being a member of the alliance. So what happens is if they end up getting rejected from that alliance, then Turkey gets forced into the arms of a series of other nations that have no relationship with that alliance, thus creating a certain strength amongst a series of nations like the Gog, Magog nations that we talk about in Ezekiel 38, thus strengthening their position for what they end up doing from the north as we read about There are so many possibilities with this, but this is one potential biblical implication of something happening. Yeah. Yeah, no, it really is. And, you know, I've I've always said that Turkey was kind of on the bubble when it came to NATO because you'll see them playing both sides of the fence. They are still very much aligned with with Russia, although they don't publicly make big announcements on that. Uh, But they have conversations with Russia all the time. In fact, when Russia has been seen flying around the area since this event kicked off, they fly from Iran. They go all the way across Saudi to the northern side of the Red Sea into the Mediterranean and then into Turkey. So that is, uh, you know, a flight pattern that happens almost on a daily basis now. And so, yeah, that that relationship is there very strong with, with Russia and Turkey as well as Iran. And so that is going to change, I think, the whole dynamics to this, uh, this from a geopolitical standpoint, because you're right. Uh, I, I think what will end up happening is Turkey will get ousted from NATO. Oh yeah. No, listen, I I agree with you. And the other thing is, is I think that article five will end up getting looked at again. I think that this will be the opportunity for nations like Poland that are really, really close to uh, Ukraine to actually say, we want to reconsider what the terms of article five actually stand for because we don't want to get dragged into a regional war that's going to end up putting us in a very, very difficult position, not only with Russia and Ukraine, but with also Belarus. It's not anything that we want a piece of, and and I think that there's probably going to be some of that going on. Now, the reason why I think that's a big deal is that becomes a big deal because NATO is, in essence, on the verge of already offing itself. And if it does exactly that and it begins to fall apart, because let's face it, 
There's two things that hold NATO together pretty substantially. The first thing is the money of the United States of America. That's probably the most significant variable that exists. The second most significant variable is Article 5. That's really the, the second most, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, compelling variable that exists. And if Article 5 becomes challenged, then the incentivization that NATO creates with respect to membership and protection by alliance members begins to diminish rapidly, and then the uh, the idea of supplying a broken organization a bunch of money begins to look a lot less attractive, and as a result, it begins to fall apart. Now, why is that significant? That's significant because potentially there are implications with either the UN or the EU, and very likely more so with the EU, right? Um, we, we could end up my guess is seeing the beginning of the assembly of the confederation of nations that we read about in the world of the final antichrist. I mean, that that's something that we could see. It's a very obvious thing. Yeah, no, it definitely is. It's, uh, you know, this is the other piece that's, I think, a, a big data point. Saudi Arabia announced that this whole peace pact that they had made on the Abraham Accords was on hold right now because of the current situation. But you and I had talked about Oh, probably almost a month ago, maybe a little longer than that. The fact that uh, Netanyahu, as well as this uh, this crown prince in Saudi, had said they already inked the deal. Oh yeah. Which, if that's the case, remember what Daniel nine twenty seven says, right? It says that uh, that he's going to the Antichrist is going to come in and make strong a covenant. That means the covenant's already there; it's already in existence. Yes, so that could very right. well be exactly what we're looking at here. Yeah, and I but listen, I don't think you're far off with that. I think that it could be something very similar to the Abraham Accords. It could be the fact that there was a weakening of the position between Jordan and Israel and Egypt and Israel as a result of all these recent happenings. And as a part of these Abraham Accords, there might be this sort of uh, all-inclusive decision to uh, put them all together and thus kind of create uh, a much larger, more robust regional agreement that exists. And by the way, there's a rumor that I'm hearing. It's not really a rumor. Uh, it's being implied by what MBS actually said recently in an interview with Brett Baer that the 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 rising or the heightening uh, difficulties and tensions that exist between India and, of course, Pakistan right by could actually change substantially as a result of this type of deal being made because a new level of incentivization, economically speaking, might enter into Pakistan, which could openly motivate them to want to cooperate in creating some newer bridge that would create the type of free trade that could change the face of everything that surrounds them. And being the fact that we're talking about nuclear powers here that are fighting with one another and the amount of... Uh, uh, let's just say lack of love that MBS has for uh, these nuclear nations threatening one another, it could create a real different type of peace in the region like we have never seen. And also, if you go back to that interview, and we can even play a portion of it right now, just a quick second of it, there's a question that Brett Baer asks MBS about the peace treaty with Israel. And he says, is there, we heard a rumor that this thing is going to be put on hold. And MBS was very quick to say, no, it's not. I mean, it was instinctively. And so my guess is he's going to keep that instinct alive. We'll play that real quick so you guys can watch it. And then uh, I'll make a quick comment on it. What would it take for you to agree to normalize relations with Israel? Well, uh, there is approach from uh, President Biden administration to get to that point. Uh, for us, the Palestinian issue is very important. We need to solve that part, and we have a good negotiation. It's continue till now. We gotta see where it will go. We hope that it will reach a place that it will uh, ease the life of the Palestinians and uh, get Israel back, uh, as a player in Middle uh, Middle East. There were reports that you had suspended talks. No, no, that's that's not true. Not true. So you think if you were to characterize it, are you close? Every day we get closer. It seems it's for the first time uh, a real one, serious. We're going to see how it goes. Yeah. So there you have it. It's right there. I mean, instinctively, I think that he gave that answer because he has absolutely no intention on, on backing up. What do you think, Monkey? Yeah, no, I would agree. And uh, I think, I think, like I said, and like we have been talking about, the fact that this thing has already been inked previously 
tells you he has no intention on backing backing away from the deal. Uh, he's probably not too pleased with what's going on right now, but this could all play into it. Uh, you could see the Temple Mount be freed up because of this, right? They may clear it, and and uh, it may be part of the the deal to you know bring in a ceasefire. It maybe maybe that's this is you know part of the big picture. We just don't see it all because you know this is this is God's plan happening, not not our plan, right? So this is it's an interesting time for sure. Yeah, no, Amen. And, and I can tell you this: I'm guessing that MBS has a very, very distinct, uh, by the way, when I say MBS, that's an affectionate term that I'm using for um, Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Mohammed bin Shalomin. And I, 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 I'm guessing, I am guessing that where he is going with this is this, it centers around a very deep rooted desire that he has to want to be in the G7 at the bare minimum. Uh, that he wants to bring Saudi Arabia back to the type of economic strength that they had at one point, prior to a lot of the maneuverings um, in Eastern and Western Europe, Asia Minor, and specifically the Middle East. He wants to be back on the map, and he wants to be, for good reason, by the way, he wants to put Saudi Arabia in that place of being one of the most well-known and significant brokers. Um, and he's going to do it, and he's going to do it very well, by the way, very, very well. Um, but it's interesting because a lot comes into play with this, Perhaps the most significant variable that comes into play is the fact that we know that Saudi Arabia will be a vocal dissenter of the attack that happens led by the leader of Russia, um, which Gog, that's presumably Gog, um, and all these other nations that are in the region of Magog, he is going to be, or Saudi Arabia is going to be the most vocal dissenter, the biggest of the vocal dissenters. Uh, although they're not going to do anything militaristically, that also makes sense. I also think it's important to note that Saudi Arabia is no fan of Hamas. It's no fan of Islamic Brotherhood, and it certainly is no fan of anybody who has any Shiite Islamic associations. Uh, even Iran, even though they've gone to the table with Iran, I can promise you this right now, they're no friends of Iran. And I'll make myself very clear there. I think it's critical to understand that. Yeah, no, you can see that with uh, the, the border war they have with Yemen and the fact that Iran is, is it's their proxy that's taking uh, most of that action down there in, in Yemen. So, um, but yeah, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with you. This is, um, it's an interesting time to be alive. There's no two ways about that. And uh, I think it, it, what a blessing it is to actually be able to see this and, and just watch it all unfold and just know that God is so mighty that that uh, he is just moving mountains right now in terms of end time prophecy. And it's just, it's just an amazing time to be alive. Man, and I got to tell you this, Monkey, and I'll give you the last comment. I think that gives us a great leeway into something that I have been saying a lot lately. And boy, I have never meant it more, uh, you know, than I do now. And that is the fact that this should serve as an incredible motivation for us to study the Bible like we've never studied it before, specifically Bible prophecy. We should be reading and reading and we should be watching and we should be sober minded because as the Apostle Paul told us, right, we are not children of the darkness that we should be overtaken as a thief in the night, but we are the children of the light. And, um, you know, he wasn't joking uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians when he tells us this in chapter 5, and it's time for us literally to watch and be sober more than ever before. Watch and be sober. Monkey, you've got the final words, brother. Yeah. Uh, hey, listen, I just remind people that have faith over fear. Don't uh, let this discourage you. Don't let uh, take your eye off the ball. This is a time to be strong in faith. It's a time to be strong in the word. It's time to not listen to people. Here's the other piece, too. There are a lot of people out there that don't know their Bible that are telling you how all this stuff is going to go down. And uh, and they're, they're completely wrong because they don't know their Bible. And so be careful who you listen to, because uh, that is, uh, you know, you can be misled very easily. Yeah, I mean, literally, bro, you're rephrasing what Jude uh, warned his people. You're rephrasing what Paul has warned so many people on different occasions. James, uh, the Lord himself, um, beware of all of those things. Amen, bro. And what a what a great final word, a great exhortation. Folks, we do sincerely hope that you have enjoyed watching this and listening to it as much as we've enjoyed making it. We are so excited because we know that Jesus is coming soon. And as a matter of fact, he could come at any moment. So let's wake up. Let's keep our heads up. Let's seek him. We love you guys. And may God richly bless you on behalf of Monkey. This is James Cadiz. We are so glad that you joined us again as we continue 
to pursue the Lord as we count down to eternity. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining us on this week's Countdown to Eternity. Follow Pastor James on YouTube and Rumble. You can also support Monkey Works on his website at monkeyworksus.com or subscribe to his YouTube channel. Countdown to Eternity is listener supported. Until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you.